Y'all, it's been three weeks since I've been here on this platform, and you're in for a doozy. <laughs> I, told, I told him back, uh, back in the booth, I was like, man, I don't know about this, this message. It's either going to be a doozy or dookie, one of the two, <laughs> but you're going you're gonna to hear something today. Um, so my name's Scott, and if you are joining us maybe for the first time or maybe the first time in a few weeks. Um, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I, I'm just grateful to be, uh, be here with you and grateful that we can be in worship together. And I just wanted to kind of let you know that we're going to start uh, over the next three weeks. I'm going to do this series, and uh, it's called uh, You Ever Wonder Why? And I've just had a number of encounters with folks who uh, recently, actually, who've been going through a rough time and um, are asking some really hard questions uh, about God and to God. And, uh, and, and some were kind of telling me, you know, that, that sermon at Easter, it really kind of resonated when, when you're asking, how do we know what really happened? How do we know that, that Jesus rose from the dead? Like, tell me... Why, why do we just assume and trust? And so if, if, you, if you didn't hear that, you can go back to listen on our podcast. But um, shameless plug number one. Uh, but we're going to look at, over the next few weeks, questions that, um, that we ask of God. And these are some difficult questions. Uh, why did God let it happen? That's this morning. Uh, why didn't God answer my prayer, and why don't I sense God's presence? Uh, if, just, a, just a moment of pure honesty and transparency. Uh, if, you wouldn't, if you would be so bold, if you've ever asked or recently asked one of these questions, would you just raise your hand? Yeah, okay. If not, great, I'll see you in three weeks. Um, but today... We want to talk about the goodness of God. Why does God let bad things happen? Why does God allow evil and suffering in the world? So it's going to be a real happy morning. Um, my kids in preschool, they learned this prayer uh, before their, their meal. They went to preschool at, a, at the church I was um, an associate at in Statesboro. And, and uh, they, were, they learned this, this prayer, God is great, God is let us thank God for our, by his hands we are, give us, Lord, our daily, amen, good luck, uh, good job, you guys get a gold star. Okay, it starts with God is great and God is good. Okay, so I'm going to get weird right off the bat, right? Um, and so I just want to ask you for a minute, you know, we don't do the whole, everybody get up and shake a hand, shake a hand next to you, you know, like that. Uh, because the introverts in the room are like, that is awful, and I hate it, right? So, um, so this moment's for you guys. Uh, I just want you to turn around, say to a neighbor, maybe somebody you don't know, you say, hey, Scott's weird, he's asking us to do this, I'm sorry, <laughs> but my name is not Slim Shady, it's whatever, right? <laughs> and... And then they say, oh, hi, my name is, you know, and then you're like, we've been coming here forever. Or no, everybody's worried about that. And just introduce yourselves. And then here's the real, the gist of it, just a minute or so. Just recount an example where you have seen the goodness of God recently. And maybe, uh, maybe some, for some that's been a hard, that's been a challenge. And, and so uh, I'm not asking you to go too deep. Really, I just want to have uh, a way of, Y'all introducing yourselves to each other in a real weird way. So, one minute. Here we go. I don't know if we have a countdown, but I'll count. Ready? Break. Do it. Hi, I'm weird. My name is such and such. Don't let people be alone. Incorporate people. We're going to be social.
I don't know the time. Has it been a minute? Is it, are we good? All right. People at home, we're glad you're worshiping with us. I'm sure they just took a coffee break. All right. The goodness of God. Hopefully, all right, all right, here, we're going to get weird again. Somebody, some, tell me the goodness of God, real quick, just short answers. Where's one example? Huh? Classroom. Did I hear that? Rain? Rain makes corn. What? Masters. All right, let's not do that. Let's not sing the whole song. All right. We are, we are in church. All right. So, God makes the weather. God, uh, there's a lot of good things that, that God is, is uh, responsible for. And in fact, in, in the book of Genesis, uh, Genesis 1, 31, it says that God looked upon all that God had made and said that it was good. So in the beginning, before human beings ever, uh, ever existed, according to the Genesis uh, 1 account, God looked upon all that God has made, and it was perfect. It had a perfect plan. It had a perfect intent. It was good. Now, have you ever doubted God's goodness? Have you ever thought, mm, okay, we say this prayer, God is great, God is good, or we say, uh, hallelujah, yours is the victory, right? And then you're kind of like, I don't know if I'm feeling that because it's been kind of a tough week. Um, it may not be as tough of a week as this person in this video. Let's uh, see. Maybe. Okay. So I've got a good deal on a houseboat in North Carolina. I really shouldn't make fun of that. It's terrible. Um, but that's an example of, you know, somebody's had a rough week. Maybe there are other personal examples, like, uh, you know, losing a job, or, or parents divorcing, or a spouse leaving, or a loved one passing, or uh, losing a job, dealing with illness. And that's just personally, interpersonally. Maybe there's global things happening. We, we know uh, from what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Yemen. We have wars going on across the globe. We have uh, famine, and child starvation, uh, and human trafficking, and, uh, and, and the innocent seem to suffer. And so we ask the question, if God is so great, and if God is so good, then why do bad things happen and why does God allow them? Why does God let evil exist? And this is, has been the million dollar question across, across time. And there's a Greek philosopher named Epicurus, and he, uh, he existed around 300 BC, and he's an author of eth ethical philosophy. So this isn't necessarily religion, but he, he promote, or proposed excuse me, three conclusions um, about the existence of God and the existence of evil. He said, if God is not able to prevent evil, then God's not all-powerful. Like we say, God's all-powerful. But if God is not able to prevent it, then God's not all-powerful. If God is not willing to prevent evil, so if God's not able, now God's not willing, then God's not all-good. And if God is both willing and able to prevent evil, then why does evil exist? So if God can control this, and God is willing, then how does evil exist? Now, Epicurus' conclusions are logical, but God doesn't work completely within the logical realm. And so evil and suffering are, are in Scripture, throughout Scripture, and they are not contrary to the story of the Bible. In fact, uh, evil and suffering are central to the story of the Bible. Christianity makes sense of giving... It, it makes sense of and it gives meaning to and offers a solution for the evil and suffering we experience. Think about all the suffering that exists in Scripture. The Bible does not shy away from pain, evil, and suffering. And there, there are countless expressions of anguish and confusion and rage and doubt and suffer, suffering and pain. There's a whole book dedicated to it, the book of Lamentations. The, the book of Job is a book about a man who suffers uh, incredibly. The prophets lament about the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the destruction of the northern and southern kingdoms. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. King David loses a child and weeps over it. 
John the Baptist's sole purpose was to prepare the way for Jesus, and he dies because of it. The Psalms are littered with, uh, with poems and stories about how people have suffered because of the, the historical calamity that's happened in their region. And then you have Jesus, who is the very Son of God, who he who himself suffers for humanity. If God is so great and God is so good, then why does evil exist? This is a great question. If God is loving, why would he allow suffering? And this is an important answer because there is some, such a thing as free will. We are given choices. Now think about love. Love is not something that is commanded. It's not something that you can order someone else to, uh, to exhibit. If love is a choice, then suffering is a, po- a possibility. You can just turn on the radio dial, or not, we don't have dials anymore, buttons. Right? I just aged myself. Uh, you can turn the radio on or go and stream music, and there are all kinds of songs about love and unrequited love and breakups and everything, and just heartache and pain, or just like good things having to do with love. But the only way love is possible is to have a choice. We cannot force people to love us. We cannot, God cannot force us to love God. Otherwise, what, what good would there be? What, what is the point in that? What is the point of a relationship? Because there's no reciprocity in that relationship. It's just a, 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 forced, it's a forced arrangement. So free will gives us the ability to choose love and hate. It gives us the ability to choose right and wrong. And this is what makes evil and bad things possible. Why did God give us free will? Because only, it's the only way that love is possible. God doesn't want a robot. God wants a relationship. And in order to have freedom to choose love, God gave us the freedom to choose evil. So if we have the choice, if we have the ability, the free will, to choose evil, then choosing evil is to, in effect, sin. It is to choose that which opposes God, which is the very definition of sin, to oppose God and to miss the mark. And when we choose sin, it leads to pain and suffering. Consequently, when sin exists in the world, sin is like this this corruption. It is a deviation from God's perfect plan where God has an intentional plan and then sin misses that mark. And when that happens, we are no longer in the realm of where God wants us to be. And ultimately, this can lead to pain and suffering, but also it has not only a personal impact, but it has a collective impact. So, choosing evil Listen, if, we're, if God were to remove evil and suffering, let's say, you know, going back to Epicurus' point, if, if God is able and willing to remove evil and doesn't, then God doesn't really have a control over evil at all, but God would have to remove our free will or God would have to remove us. Only one is possible. So, how would you like to be in an existence and in a relationship where you had no choice. You had no option. It was forced on you. You are living in the matrix, in this alternate reality where you think you have choice, but you don't. If suffering must exist because free will exists, what happens in the wake of suffering is actually evidence of God's love. Think about this. Teachers, where are my teachers at? I get a hard time from teachers because they they said I preached a a sermon a while ago and that I was really uh, I was really hard on teachers and I was I didn't mean to be hard on teachers. I just said you know that can be hard that can be a hard life, right? Uh, So you're getting to the end of the school year and you're you're like choosing every day probably right now whether you want to quit tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Um, yeah, amen? Okay. <laughs> and you're like, no, my 401k won't allow it, or I need the benefits, or I need health insurance. You know, and you're like, I, I, day one, I loved what I was doing. Day, day 170, I just want to not hurt somebody, Okay. <laughs> But you, (laughs) 
No, it's all right. T Fox, you want to come out? Come up here and finish? No, it's good. Um, but there is there is an amount of suffering when you uh, when you work with uh, students uh, all the time, and even when you parent them. Um, because people are growing, people are developing, we are not perfect. We as leaders, we as teachers, we as parents, we're not perfect. And so um, sin enters into the world. And then how, and we in some respects suffer, maybe whether it's uh, through disrespect or suffering through a lack of turned in assignments, or, or, or you just maybe sometimes you don't feel like you're getting through uh, to students and you, you can't control what goes on at home and you know that what's being brought into the classroom is being, is being brought from the home. And so there are a lot of dynamics at play. And so you suffer uh, through, through some of the things that are happening that, over which you have no control. But then at the end of the year, you know, yes, summer's coming, right? You also know, uh, hopefully, you are reminded by past students that you make a difference. Maybe if, as a parent, you're reminded by you, a, a child that you make a difference, Maybe there is something that is impacting them. Maybe they don't tell you, but maybe there is something that you see that matters in their life. You know that there is something good that is happening, that there is something good on the horizon. And if you suffer through it and you suffer well, something good will be at the end of the tunnel. Maybe it's if, maybe think about physical therapy. You suffer through rehab and you're like, is this worth it? I'd rather have not had the surgery to begin with, or I'd rather have not told the doctor I'm having arm pain, and now I have to go to this. And, but think about what's at the end, this rehab to alleviate pain. Or think about a medical diagnosis where there is fear and there is anxiety, and you're wondering what is going to happen, but suffering through it is getting the best treatment that can be afforded to you at the time that, that exists so that hopefully you may be made well in the end. Think about a counselor or a therapist who is asking you to go to delve deeply into your past, and you're like, ah, no, I don't, I'd really rather not. And then it's when you go to those levels and you're willing to be weak and you're willing to be vulnerable that that's where, where the Bible, the scripture passage that says we are made perfect through weakness, where we are made strong through God who gives us strength, where we are content in all things because God has given us all the things that we need. When we go through that and we suffer through that, there is something good on the horizon. Suffering is not the end. It is when we suffer well that we can point to the understanding that something better is coming. Something better is coming. Amen? Here's an illustration of what I mean. This is, I say this, I think maybe every other week that I preach, but this is absolutely one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And I say this because it really speaks to the nature of, of God, and it speaks to the nature of suffering. And it also speaks to the nature of how we as humans approach suffering in negative ways and how we can approach it in a different way. And so this is from John chapter 9. As he went along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? Whose sin, whose fault is it? And in that time, in that day, they believed this person had, an, had, a, had a malady, had, a, had an issue, and then it, was, it was the cause of sin, or the, the reason was because of sin in the family, that it's their fault. So it wasn't a genetic anomaly. It wasn't anything. I mean, they didn't have any kind of knowledge of science about that, about that in those days. They just, they just pointed to what they could rudimentary, rudimentarily understand at that day. It's somebody's fault. We must cast blame. And so this person's evil is the result of their actions. And Jesus, he says, y'all, this is the southern translation, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Now, another translation uh, that I like also says, uh, this man was born blind so that the glory of God may be revealed through him. In other words, we won't really get, a, get anywhere asking the question, why 
something is the way it is because it is what it is. And there are things over which we have no control. And we can remain static in our lives and, and cast blame to God or cast blame to others or we can find fault or we can stop and pause and say, how might I, despite this unfair situation, approach it in such a manner that the glory of God might be revealed through me and so others may know the true nature of God. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with saliva, and he put it on the man's eyes. And go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. So there is an encounter with Jesus. The disciples blamed somebody in his family. This is not a man's fault for the way he is. He has this encounter with Jesus. He is transformed by this encounter. He goes, and now, what, what is the result of this man's, this man's transformation? He wants to tell everybody about it. And his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, is this the same guy? Some claimed that he was, and others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself instead insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes, and he told me to go and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. This is funny. I don't know. That way. A fleeting encounter with Jesus has the, has the ability to transform a life and the, the course of one's future. I'm going to get a little wonky here, and, and I hope you'll bear with me as I kind of drive this to a conclusion. These are very real questions that we ask. Why does evil exist? There's a theologian who wrote a book. Uh, his name's Leslie Weatherhead, and he wrote this book in 1944, and, and it's not, um, it, it, the irony was not lost on me that he was writing during, during the time of World War II. And some of the things that he wrote were so prescient for the time. Uh, and he actually had something to say about the will and nature of God. And, and, and something he said was extremely convicting, at least for me. So we ask, why is the man born blind? Why do some people get COVID and others don't? Why have we lost loved ones, but others have not? Why does cancer affect some but not others? Why, God, why? Weatherhead writes, so many healthy people are spiritually asleep and are not cooperating with God at all. And so many sick people have, through the sickness, become spiritually awakened during their illness that out of the circumstances of evil, they have created and set free spiritual energies far more valuable than the spiritual apathy of the healthy person. Whew. That's like a Randy Macho Man Savage body slam. YouTube that. It's awesome. On the spiritually apathetic. that there are sick persons who are far greater in their testament of who God is than this, this, and spiritually awakened and spiritually alive than healthy people who take their health for granted because they know or have no need for God. He writes about three types of wills of God. He said there's the intentional will of God so that God has an ideal plan. In the beginning, God created all things and they were good. This is God's ideal plan. It's for humanity. But then there's a circumstantial will of God. God does not intend for people to be sick. A, a good, holy, loving God would not 
create evil or institute evil to teach people a lesson so that they might follow God. Y'all know how sick and twisted that is? And if you ever hear that, please correct somebody or send them my way. God will not break the law of God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. So here, I'm going to, I'm going to, I heard a preacher one time say that Hurricane Katrina was, was a, a judgment on New Orleans. I about wanted to go through the television and fight that guy. Which would not have been a holy testament, you know, it would not have been good either. But that is not what God is in the business. God is in the business of reconciling people unto God in relationship, not through force and coercion. So there's the circumstantial will of God that says, okay, in these circumstances, which is not ideal, how then might the will of God be present? So in the man who was born blind, this is a circumstance. He didn't ask for it. He didn't want it. He was treated as an outcast. His life was probably miserable. And yet, here in this moment, Jesus, this encounter he has with Jesus Jesus says, you too are loved, and you too can be the change this world needs because of what I am going to do through you. So suffer well, my friend. I'm sorry this is happening to you, but it does not have to be the thing that defines you, but how you live through it ultimately can be that. And then there's the ultimate will of God. So there's the circumstances, it's temporary, it's for the time, and then the ultimate will of God is what happens in the end. Behold, in Revelation, God, I'm creating a new heaven and a new earth. The story's already written. We win some and we lose some here in this earth, in this life, and ultimately we all will pass away. But in the end... We all may be raised to life with Christ. Weatherhead writes, we, must simply, we simply must break with the idea that everything that happens is the will of God in the sense of being his intention. It is within the will of God, if you must use the phrase, in circumstances we have hinted at already, but we must come to terms with the idea that the intentional will of God, hear this, can be defeated by the will of man for the time being. Why does injustice exist in the earth? Because of sin, because of the choices of humanity. And this can overcome the circumstantial will of God. If this were not true, then man would have no real freedom at all. We would be merely God's puppets. All evil that is temporarily successful temporarily defeats God. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because evil exists in the world. We can't explain why it affects some and not others. But what we know is just as Jesus was crucified on a cross and death was the victor on that day where evil overcame God, three days later, the ultimate will of God proved that something better is coming. Amen? You see, even Jesus did not say, I have explained the world. He said, I have overcome the world. A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered each to your own home, you will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Wherever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you're going through now, whatever pain and suffering you have experienced, whatever questions you have rightfully Asked of God to say, 
Why, God, did you make this happen? Know this. It is only temporary. And Jesus' resurrection proves that something better is coming. And so when we suffer, and we suffer well, we determine and we show the very existence of God that is resurrecting in us and radiating to people around us. I close with this. Revelation says this. What is the ultimate will of God? God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. This may be hard to acknowledge in the moment when we're like, I just, I just want to be better or I just want my loved one to live or I just want COVID to go away or I just want relief. We want relief. Take heart. For I have overcome the world, he says. Take heart, for I've overcome the world. And you, whether it is in this life or the next, can be with God forever. Amen.